What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. That is me. With me, as always, super producer Brandon Newman, my dad, Mike Golick Sr. And dad, our long national nightmare is sort of over. The Saquon Barkley New York Giants stare down ends. Uh, like most relationships where both sides want the other to end it by doing the bare minimum. So uh, they got this done. Saquon Barkley signs a one-year deal with the New York Giants that is worth $10.1 million fully guaranteed, including a $2 million upfront signing bonus. The deal includes $1 million of incentives with an equal amount paid for 1,300 rushing yards, 11 touchdowns, and 65 receptions on the season. And, uh, Dad, uh, I guess all that talk about actually sitting out the season sounds a lot better uh, in theory than it does in practice. So I would imagine when a lot of people saw this or read about it, there was a lot of head scratching because the one thing we have ingrained in everybody's head and people have known for years is July 17th, rolls around, you don't have a long-term deal done, you have to plan that one-year deal, that's it. And all of a sudden, it was like Saquon Barkley and the Giants agree to an $11 million deal, and everybody's like, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be able to do that. So explanation, and oh, by the way, this is the first time this has happened in 18 years, by the way. But what you can do is you can do one-year deals, you can't do any more than one-year deals, but the, and the base salary still has to be whatever the franchise tag was. And as Mike explained, it is. It's $10.1 million, of which they are taking $2 million and giving it to him right now. And then there is, the, as Mike mentioned, the $900,000 or a million in incentives that he can get as well. I'm not going to lie, Mike. I'm not going to sit there and act like I know everything. I didn't know they could do that. I didn't know they could add to it like that with incentives um, to, to help get the thing done for one year. But that's exactly what they did. A key point here, in this deal, it was not agreed upon, and Saquon Barkley did not demand this. He can still get franchise tag next year. And if he does, it comes at 120% of what it was this year, $10.1 million. So you wonder if this is going to be an avenue for Josh Jacobs with the Raiders now uh, as well. Will they work out some one-year deal? But I was surprised, and, and I heard people saying, Saquon, but you know, does Saquon Barkley win it all in this? No, he doesn't win it all. Sure, he wins. I mean, he wins by making eleven million dollars. You know, you go ahead and sit a year, you're not making that money up. So he 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 gets eleven million dollars. He didn't win by getting a long term deal. No, the Giants absolutely won because their best player is now in the fold, and certainly the fans won because they get to see Saquon Barkley, and now you know could be a legitimate race with the Giants, the Cowboys, and the Eagles though I think it'll be the Eagles for that division title. But, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I was a little confused. I didn't know you could do this either. But as I mentioned, it's the first time something like this has happened with the tag in 18 years. Yeah, it's getting creative around the margins, right? And that's why I said it, it's doing the bare minimum. Like, uh, I saw, I think it was Ross Tucker, our compatriot here at DraftKings, tweet out, Chris Jones is getting ready to sit out in training camp for $50,000 a day, and all it took for Saquon Barkley to come back into training camp was them handing him $2 million up front on a deal where – Besides that, the rest of I mean, the rest of these incentives, Dad, relative to Saquon's career production, are going to be pretty difficult to hit for yeah, the added are. amount yes. of a couple of million yep. dollars. Like there, I think there's one year in Saquon's career where he would have actually hit the majority of these incentives, and so it, it, it's it's tough for it to feel like a win for Saquon, Dad. But it's a reminder that oh. also the other thing, like going out there and fighting for the cause, is really hard. Like what Le'Veon Bell did is hard. What what these guys do actually threatened to sit out not just training camp but yep. even that dad like if you're Saquon Barkley the thought of sitting out training camp and maybe feeling like that voice in the back of your head like what if they're okay without me what if a lot of the stuff that people are saying about the nature of offense or my position is true has got to be a difficult thing to sit with and, and listen make no mistake the running back situation as it is right now and what they're trying to accomplish, yeah, this is not a win for Saquon Barkley. This is not a win for the running backs. But, again, he's, he has a chance to make $11 million. You know, they gave him $2 million oh, I, I, I now. I get he, that. Like, I get that. Like, But that's, like, relative to society, obviously. Like, making $11 million is dope. Uh, 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 agreed. So, But I guess what I'm saying is 
it wasn't a loss in every single check of the box for Saquon Barkley. He's going to make $10, $11 million this year. The other way around it was going to be to sit the entire year like Le'Veon Bell and then maybe get a deal like Le'Veon Bell got that next year. So I'm not willing to say somebody lost when they're going to make 10 or $11 million. I'm, I'm just not. Now, is there any, any kind of huge win in this? Absolutely not. There isn't. But none of us thought Saquon Barkley was going to sit out anyway, right? And, and, and he can't negotiate any more than what he did. He couldn't do a long-term deal. So this is about all he could do. He was going to show up. At least I think he was. I don't think he's the type of guy that was going to sit out. Josh Jacobs, we'll see. Maybe he will. But I don't think Saquon was. I think Saquon wanted to play. And most guys want to play. And as you said, and you're right, it is hard to draw that line in the sand and say, I am not playing the entire year. That has not happened an awful lot. So I think he was just saying, I'm going to make as I'm knowing in himself, I'm going to play. Okay, what's my best avenue to play? What can anything look like a partial tiny win for me? Getting $2 million up front, getting 900000 in incentives, which you said correctly, it's going to be hard for him to reach. So, yeah, from the outside looking in, it doesn't look at all like he won. But like I said, he's going to pocket over $10 million this year, so that doesn't suck either. But I guess it makes me wonder if you weren't willing to sit out meaningfully. Because I don't know Saquon enough to know if I would be calling his bluff or not on that. And especially with the desperate position running backs are in right now, like this is a devastating blow to that if you're the overall running back market. But then why you wouldn't at least take the shorter term, uh, the long term deal that was still shorter term yep. that paid you out basically what the equivalent was of this year and next year's tag. Because best case scenario, Dad, if he goes through and he hits all these incentives and he does great, they're just going to tag him again. Like the world is going right. to get better for Saquon on the other yep. side of this. Yep. No, I, listen, I agree. But I, I'll, I will continue to say because we look at the short lifespan of an NFL player, it's short. And the shortest within the game is the running back position. So, you know what? My thought is if you can grab some money, you grab the money. You take the money. If you don't, you win a year without making the money. Now, I understand there was no wear and tear on your body as well uh, because he has been injured before. But in this short business, and we're talking about sports and so much money in sports from soccer and basketball and what they get, that's just not there in football outside of the quarterback position, and the longevity just isn't there. So uh, you know what? To me, I'm sorry. You, I, I end up with over $10 million. In the general scheme of things, I did not win, but I'm still going to make $10 million. I was going to say, I think that's what it is, is it kind of feels like a stalemate, right? You didn't lose because you're going to make $10 right. million, but you didn't win. There's right. not a, there's not no. really oh, a win no. here. There's like a, no. we shake hands and keep moving. Dead, you mentioned the other interesting name in this. What they've got going on with Josh Jacobs in the Raiders conversation. I saw David Hellman from Speak over on FS1 point this out. It was interesting that Saquon, and I guess it's the New York fashion of this, it's obviously he was a top 10 pick back in the day. There's a number of reasons why I guess you could say he became the face of this pretty quickly. He also talked, like we saw him speak on this on podcasts and stuff, but Josh Jacobs has a, in some ways a more compelling case to be the guy that gets paid than even Saquon did. With Josh Jacobs, the low-hanging fruit, because remember, he was last year's rushing champ. He's outperformed at Saquon, I believe. More often than not, he's got, let's see, of course, David Hellman's tweet, 500 more yards and 11 more touchdowns than Saquon in the same number of games while being in the league for one less season. If you're going to pay a 25-year-old who's averaging 12 yards a year, who are you going to pay? The low-hanging fruit for people against paying Josh Jacobs is, well, look what that got you. The Raiders have been bad. They've been in turmoil because the quarterback position's not figured out while Josh McDaniels is coming in there. But, Dad, production-wise and what he means to that team, who I don't think has an offensive line as good as the Giants, and certainly has a quarterback that is injury-prone coming into this and a coach of Josh McDaniels who needs this to work, you could argue that Josh Jacobs has a bit more leverage in the situation than even Saquon did. I mean, think about what Josh Jacobs did. So Josh Jacobs, and I was out in Vegas before his fifth year, when I, and I did an event with him and Devontae Adams. And this is when the, the Raiders did not pick up his fifth-year option, right? So 
number one, that kind of ticks you off. And what did he do? He had a monster year. He had more touches than any other running back. He had a big year for the Raiders. And so I'm sure his thought was, okay, you didn't pick up my fifth-year option. I just had a great year. All right, now let's go. And they tag him. They tag him for the 10-1. So he had to be like, are you guys serious? You know, how you're screwing with me here? So I believe he is ending up going to be more upset than Saquon was in this situation. And but but again, I, I'm I'm not sure. We we sit there and talk about leverage. What what leverage do, does a running back have in the NFL now with their value going down outside of again sitting out? And then do you hurt yourself in that as well? But I I he was a guy who I think had the the right. There's no right. There's just your your feeling of being the most mad of. You did this to me. I proved you wrong, and you still tag me and don't give me a long-term deal. Yeah, I, I think when I talk about leverage, because we've looked at the running back market overall a lot, the way I want to look at it is also now a little bit more team-specific because I think the conversation going forward gets pretty interesting about what can happen and with who as far as running backs being quote-unquote valued around the league here. And I want to get to in a second a tweet I saw from Dan Orlovsky about this this morning that hints at what could maybe come next if you're Saquon Barkley or Josh Jacobs should you end up on a similar deal going into this season. So, Dad, I saw uh, Dan Orlovsky, our, co our, our old colleague over at ESPN, tweeting this morning back and forth with ESPN NFL insider Field Gates about the prospect of a trade. Like, there's nothing in this deal that you know stops a team right. from going out and trying to trade for Saquon Barkley. Right. And it's interesting because this would be an incredibly manageable deal to trade, right? We saw the big trade go down for Christian McCaffrey last year where the 49ers supercharged their offense by bringing that titanic deal over from the Carolina Panthers. This one now a lot more manageable, the Giants taking care of $2 million up front. But, Dad, do you think at this point anyone's willing to give up resources for running backs right now? Because I think there's an interesting case to be made for a team like the Buffalo Bills, who is further along in its life cycle, who is knocking on the door of championship contender, that a team like that with an obvious need is a much better candidate to bring on and value, quote-unquote, a running back than some of these teams that are – further away from that prize who understand that they have bigger issues they have to fix before running back becomes something they can think about. It's kind of a higher level problem. For, Mike, as far as Saquon is concerned, I, I, I would think it would be ridiculous to trade him. Because again, I said this before, even if you pay him well for a running back, it's still less than a tight end, which is, I think, the next lowest position group. It's not a ton of money. And he did. You did not have to sign anything, or or that says you wouldn't tag him next year. So you can tag him next year and keep him. This guy, I, I just personally don't believe he's going to sit. He would have to do that. Josh Jacobs could be a different story because what what do you when, when you're trading something? What are we talking about here? Is getting value. Say Josh Jacobs did a deal like Saquon, but had the Raiders sign something that said you can't tag me next year. Well, then it's like. Now I would look into trading him because unless you really are going to pay him because now you could lose him for nothing. Isn't that what we always talk about in trades and other sports? Do you trade a guy before you lose him for nothing? And if you can't tag Josh Jacobs next year and he's ticked at your organization and basically may not sign back with you anyway, then I would think about trading him if there's a trade partner out there because you, you would lose him for nothing if he was a free agent. Saquon, you get to tag again. So you're not going to lose him, and I don't think he would hold out again next year. I, and he's such a meaningful part of that offense. We, we sit there and say he's the whole offense. Listen, I mean, come on, people. We, we, we know he's not the whole offense, but let me tell you, he's the monster majority of that offense, whether he's the, <clears throat> the guy running the ball, whether he's the main receiver, receiver, whether he's an outlet for Daniel Jones, he's important. But I don't see him getting traded, Mike, because they have the leverage of being able to tag him next year. They do, but again, he's clearly only worth so much to them. Like That's the moral of this entire story is he's only worth so much. These guys are only worth so much to organizations. And so I just wasn't sure what it would look like price tag-wise to make him think about it, where it's, again, like, 
oh, well, I can just go and draft a younger, stronger guy in that same spot, and I believe this can work well. I can reset our clock at that position by getting a young guy back in the building and get out in front of this if someone were to fish just a little bit more. And again, you can argue in this current NFL that, you know, why would another team that's further along do that and not just go for a young guy? But you know this, Dad, when you're knocking on the door and you feel like you're close. And for Buffalo, we already think their best roster may be behind them. But if you're trying to continue to max things out here, then maybe, especially on a one-year loan or a guy that could produce like that at that position that, again, team-specific, because a lot of these are going to have to be that way. Christian McCaffrey to the 49ers was team specific. What they do with versatile pieces, especially in the backfield, is unique in this NFL. For the uh, for the Buffalo Bills, you got a relationship with the entire Giants front office, and as a team, running back's been a deficiency for a while, and you just got thinner during training camp. So I'm not saying maybe exactly them, but you see what I'm saying. Circumstances could bring to a point where maybe while you've got these guys on affordable deals that do offer some control, and if you're further along in your team life cycle, maybe it becomes worth a conversation at least. So I, I, I guess I guess I would still say with Saquon Barkley, he's 26 years old. The they signed Daniel Joseph to the big deal. They made the playoffs last year. They're on an upward trajectory, right? And it's not like Saquon is 29 or 30. So if and he's such a big part of that offense. I and and believe me, I understand a younger guy that can come in or a lower draft pick that can come in and start to get it done. But he's getting it done. He's 26 years old, and you have a team that's climbing. You have a team also in the division that has the best team in the NFC in the Philadelphia Eagles, so that's who you're battling as well as the Cowboys. I just think because he, if he was 29, I would agree more with the trading of him, but he's 26. He's a, he's a guy that I hang on to while they're making strides to work their way through the playoffs. Yeah, I would agree in general, but again, this whole process, and I get part of it's the market, but it also indicates they only care about that but so much. Like, that only matters to them but so much. And that's kind of the same thing. That's why, that's why the Josh Jacob thing is going to be fascinating to me. Because, yes. again, you could argue they need him more. Like, you got Jimmy Garoppolo limping into this thing, and you've got a team that, yeah, was bad last year. They won six games. So, again, what does the rushing title get you? It gets you six wins in the toughest division in football and an understanding that you're going to need the quarterback thing to work. But, again, you look at the overall picture, Dad. Brian Dable's good in New York right now. Like, he's not going anywhere. Yeah, he, he had a ton to show after year one. Josh McDaniels, they've been trying to fire this dude for a while now, it seems like. It's been not sweet out there in Vegas in a kind of turbulent situation. He needs this to work this year. That offense needs Jimmy Garoppolo to come in and show returns this year, and they need someone to keep the floor where it's been, like Josh Jacobs, this year. And if he were really to threaten to do something, all of a sudden you look at that team's depth. I think I saw Brandon Bolden, the old Patriots running back in there. Zamir White was yeah. their draft pick out of Georgia. But none of those guys scream bell cow behind an offensive line that doesn't look like a bunch of world beaters. So that situation – I think probably was more compelling than we gave it credit for all along. I think David Hellman may have been right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's going to get in. And I agree with you about Josh Jacobs because we keep talking about the year Saquon had. Josh Jacobs, almost 1,700 rushing yards, and he only had, what, four less receptions than Saquon did? And, and so, I mean, he was – and that's a, a, an offense with Devontae Adams. So I, I'm with you of his value, and that's a dude – that had to feel so disrespected of not not getting a fifth year option picked up and then tagged that now he the focus goes off of Saquon as he's going to report to Cap uh, Camp and on Josh Jacobs is he going to be in the same situation now as Saquon and do a one year deal? Yeah, speaking of reporting to Camp too, now that uh, this is the case and Saquon Barkley is there, he gets to get ready for one specific element of camp that we all love and enjoy. So, uh, Dad, is Saquon Barkley now uh, getting ready to report to training camp, and it sounds like he's already in the building for the Giants once this was going down, after what I'd imagine had to be one of the bleakest Zoom calls in history, and that's saying yeah. a lot, <laughs> considering this is what was on the other side of it. Uh, he now gets to walk in and get ready for the old conditioning test. Dad, how many uh, great memories does that flood back into your head? I'm telling you, and, and I'm I'm interested to hear – I know some of yours and our, and our next guest as well, as far as what it's been more like now. 
I got into the league in 85 with the Houston Oilers. And <clears throat> the first couple of teams I was with, the Oilers and the Eagles, I, I was stunned at how dumb the test was. So you're in professional football. You're a professional athlete where now everything rides on you, right? If you're prepared, you're prepared. If you're not, it's your own damn fault and you may lose your job. You know, that's just how it works. So the preparation should be nothing but prepping for the game of football and getting ready for the season. Our test, when I got drafted in 1985 by the Houston Oilers, was a 12-minute run. A 12-minute run. And depending on what position you were, you had to make it a certain distance, right? For linemen, uh, it was like a mile and a half, I think it was, something like that. <clears throat> and I thought to myself, okay, I, I, I'm just into the league now, but I was there a, a couple of years. I said, this seems dumb. There is nothing about a 12-minute run that prepares you to get in shape for the game of football of quick burst, rest, quick burst, rest, quick burst, rest. It is a 12-minute freaking run. It made no sense to me. So then I leave there and I go to Philadelphia. And I'm like, you know, okay, maybe this will be better. We ran an 880. I mean, we ran an uh, lineman running an 880. Mike, imagine 300 pounds, 320 pounds when you lock up on that last half a lap, when all of a sudden it, the, the piano is on your back. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the hell? Now you have to take time as you're preparing for the season to practice a 12 minute run. Now you have to take time instead of practicing football shape to get ready for an 880 run. It was the dumbest thing in the world. I, I never understood it. I never understood why a test doesn't impart actual what you need for football, a 40 yard, a 60 yard, maybe a hundred yard sprint or no more than that, a little bit of a rest, then to do it again, quick stop, quick stop, quick stop. That to me should be the test. It shouldn't be, well, let's do something that's so out of character of football just to see if they're working. You know what? We're pro athletes. If we're not working, we're, it's our own damn fault and we're going to lose our job. So, you know, how it, it and, and you're just setting up for a guy to yank a hammy, you know, in a 12 minute run or an 880 when they're trying to sprint the last hundred of it or 200 of it to make the time you have to make. You don't think a 310 pounder I've seen more than a few pull up with a hammy? Then where are you? I mean, it's it's crazy to do. I uh what was the conditioning test you did back in the day on Mike and Mike? It was when Albert Hainsworth failed Albert his Hainsworth. conditioning test. <clears throat> it was uh it was that 60 yard shuttle, like the 5, 10, 15, which again is cool because along with the 880 in Philly, we also did the gassers. We did sideline back you know, as, as a test too, again, which was kind of quicker, but yeah, I did the Albert Hainsworth, uh, five, 10, 15 test, five back, 10 back, 15 back, uh, for the test, because after he signed his hundred million dollar contract, he basically couldn't do the test. Which man, I, you know what, the further and further along we go, Albert Hainsworth signing that deal and then failing to feel motivated. I, I wonder how that doesn't happen more often. Like after we just saw Killian Mbappe yeah. get offered 1.1 1 .1, or I guess 776 million dollars by the Saudis yeah. to go and play in their soccer league over there. I, I don't know how you take a dollar amount like that and then show up for work the next year. They're like, well, then he could just walk and go to PSG or he could walk and go to Real Madrid next year for free. And it's like, for who? For what? you got a billion dollars basically at that point. What the hell am I going to be working for again? Yeah, by the way, if he goes to Real Madrid, I think he's going to get handed $100 million. So it's not like he's going anywhere for free. So, no, you know, they're, no, exactly. They're going to get paid. Yeah. Oh, man, no, money coming in. Speaking of money coming in, uh, very excited to get some more beef in the frame here. Uh, former NFL veteran offensive lineman Marshall Newhouse kind enough to join us here on the program today. And Marshall, I'm sorry to like trigger any sort of PTSD here as you walk into us talking about conditioning tests. Yeah, you know, that's the first thing I want to hear when I've not set an alarm, but gotten up on my own volition when the sun rises and not having PTSD from maybe missing a meeting or getting woken up at 5 a.m. for a drug test. I need to hear about conditioning. Thanks. Appreciate it. 
So, so Marshall, I'm trying to look at the difference. I got in the league in 85, and I just told you my tests, uh, a 12-minute run and 880, which is ridiculous. And this, too, also, from the lifting standpoint, we did one rep maxes, which mm. is just ludicrous. I mean, to load, forgetting the bench, <laughs> loading the weight we did on our backs for a one rep of a squat was crazy. So you got in the league, I think, what, about 2010. What was the conditioning test at those points for the teams you were on? Yeah, there wasn't a one rep max test. That was like still in college um, where, you know, I saw a couple knees get blown out and they're like, ah, maybe we should rethink this. But in the NFL <laughs> from lifting wise, they kind of, you had a program and they left guys alone. But conditioning, I was on the cusp. I, I had to transition where we were two days, the old school way, conditioning test. And then after the new CBA, which was after my first year, then things kind of started to ramp down as far as the intensity. But we ran, yeah, shuttles, 300-yard shuttles, which anyone who's done them knows they're just, they're no joke, especially for time. And then, you know, on the other end of that was just like teams finally figured out, hey, yeah, there are guys who won't run. There are guys who are not like they should. Let's not kill them and make sure that they're injured because they're, you know, maybe not the most responsible guys. And then you start doing 40-yard, you know, striders, 50-yard uh, striders, over and back, stuff that was less intense, but it wasn't meant to like, punish you on the first day. Um, but yeah, it's just, I imagine there are places other than where I was that were still trying to do that, but it slowly has kind of faded away. Yeah, merci mercifully so. Like, I, I think a lot of those end up just being, and especially what Dad described, kind of busy work. So it, it's, yeah. Yeah. hey, can you check this box? Can you show us that you were doing something in the off season for the time we didn't have you? And then let's get on our merry way here. Um, Marshall, before you got on to, we were talking about Saquon signing the one-year deal leading up to this. Like, if you're his teammate when you see him in the locker room after all this, like, what are you saying to him? Because I got to imagine there's a lot of complicated feelings for Saquon walking back in there. There are no complicated feelings for Saquon walking back in there because you understand the argument. You also understand the, the landscape that things are in right now. So you're like, bro, that sucks. I'm sorry. Because we know how, how vital you are. You are we you were our offense, probably are our offense going forward. They probably should have paid you before, Daniel. This is these are unspoken things, but we know what it is. We know where the value is, we know what you mean to this team, but we understand that this is an ever-changing market uh, for the running backs and you know the value they create and the time frame in which they create the most value and the steep we, like we get all of that stuff. So I'm dapping him up. I'm like, if I spend on my lineman, I'm like, bro, I appreciate you. You're going to make all my blocks look better. Thanks for showing up. Uh, I hope you get your money some kind of way. Um, we, you know, ultimately, you don't want a pocket watch. We're not, you know, you're, we want what's best for the guy. But, you know, his money is his money. We have to deal with our own business. But you're just glad he's in the building. That's just, just point blank. So along those lines, Marshall, I, I've been trying, as people – try to come up with solutions and obviously Twitter world is full of those who think they have the answer. <laughs> what would your answer be to those that are, and there's plenty of people saying it, well, the other positions out there should take less money so the running backs could make more money. So if somebody said, Marshall, you as you guys, your old lineman, your old lineman as a group should take less money so running backs could get more money, what would your answer be to that? Let me put it in, in lineman terms. Listen, there's a pie. You, you name the flavor of the pie, and you're asking a lineman, a guard or a tackle, to take less of the pie to leave more for a running back when the argument should be us as players should have more of the bigger pie uh, versus the owners and the actual revenue of the entire league, which we're approaching $25 billion. So uh, the, the plan for this is just – it's – complicated and the problem is it only will come up a solution a, 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 a gap for a solution will only come up the next CBA negotiation which is in seven years and this is ultimately still uh, something that is like it's a market condition um, I, I tweeted something the other day where I'm like if you're an up and coming running back if you're a teenager a kid who's like really you know you watched him at Smith you watched you know the Saquons of the world you name your running back and that's what you want to play uh, a, you're taking a risk by doing that. If, if, if you break all the odds and you make it to the NFL, um, 
if you go and you pound your body for free, now we've got NIL and stuff in college, but if you go and pound your body for three, four years for free, if you're not making yourself a versatile running back who can catch, who can run routes out of the backfield, out of the slot position, maybe a different body style. And if you're ultimately like staying an extra year, I remember someone brought this up to me the other day. Have we, have you guys heard the name Bryce Love in a while? You remember Bryce Love out of Stanford? Mm -hmm. Bryce yeah. Love out of Stanford was a running back who was slotted to go first, I think late first round, high second round, went back to Stanford. We all applauded him for it because we understand what that education can do for you. And then blows his knee out and he gets drafted still in the fifth round, but we literally never hear from him again. Your value, your window is so short and it's earlier than every other position. So you, the entire landscape of the running back has to be really evaluated. There's no way to do it in apples to apples way um, with the rest of the, the positions. We're just, football is such a differentiated team sport. There's just no way to do that in a fair way. So the next CBA, uh, by the time the next CBA rolls around, we'll see what the landscape looks like, but there's not a clean solution. People have talked about letting them hit uh, free agency sooner, taking away the franchise tag. I'm I'm for that. That's a bargaining chip that we players gave away too easily, that owners are, are abusing. They're abusing to keep guys out of free agency for another year and putting their bodies at risk. Um, there, are, there are piecemeal solutions, but as a whole, uh, you're talking about comparing – one position to another in an apple, apple, apples to apples way. And that's just, it's just not going to be, be doable, I don't think. So we'll have to rethink no. it, you know, when the next CBA comes around. I, I think the advice would be if you've got the choice, maybe just play D tackle instead because Chris Jones on the, <laughs> like, as this has all been going on, Chris Jones is on the total other side of this where I feel like dude can just kick his feet up and wait because as he's getting ready to eat 50 grand a day, not reporting to camp because he wants a new deal with the Chiefs. Marshall, it doesn't seem like there's any world where he doesn't get it. Now, I think I saw reports yesterday that he wants close to $30 million a year average, which would put him average annual value just below Aaron Donald, which is where every D tackle more or less ends up because everyone kind of knows the drill there. But that's a position where right now, Marshall, you could argue in the NFL of today as it keeps spreading out, a defensive tackle, especially with his skill set, is just getting more and more valuable. Now, that is true leverage. The running backs holding out or not having signed their contract, that's not leverage right now. It's just, it's all relative. But Chris Chris Jones is true leverage right now. And you've got Pat Mahomes, who we know is the best QB in the league, who has vocally said uh, that, you know, he wants to be the highest paid quarterback, but he's willing to, you know, massage the contract details to make sure that he keeps stars around him. Well, who bigger star to help you win another ring than Chris Jones up the middle, who gets sacked in games after you score the winning touchdown or get your team in field goal position. So yeah, he's he is a top two at his position. Um, and you know, camp is when those deadlines kind of spur actions thing. And yeah, he gets to relax and you know, hopefully stay in shape and not take a beating for a week, two, three weeks of camp, which I think is gravy for his body and his you know whole disposition. So yeah, that's. To me, that he, he's in a whole nother camp in the running backs. To Marshall's point about him being the closer, uh, last season, 71% of his sacks in the regular season ended an opponent's drive. He led the league with 34 fourth quarter pressures, and he's second in the league over the last three seasons with 120 QB pressures overall. So he is getting the job done every which way, and he's south of 30. Pass, go, collect $200. Yep. Yeah, and listen, he's 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 money, and he's and he's been money. He's a guy that they they have to work out because unlike, you know, we as as we've brought up, we saw Clyde Edwards Hilaire, a, a top pick for the Chiefs, get beat beaten out by a seventh rounder. You don't see that a lot. You don't see nobody stepping in for Zach Martin if he holds out with the Cowboys, and you're going to have just as good. Nobody's stepping in for Chris Jones and going to be that good. So these guys truly have leverage. And I wish I was ever at a point in my nine-year career when I could have actually held out. That would have been so nice. But talk <laughs> about being afraid to do that. Was Marshall, you ever hold out? Have you ever been able to do that? I never even sniffed a holdout. What do you mean? But my, my version <laughs> of a holdout, my version of a holdout was being a free agent um, and, and getting calls after camp when guys got hurt. That was my version of a holdout. I held out one – I can't even call it a holdout. I, I was redoing a deal, and it got up to the first day of camp. I didn't make it past the opening stretching 
of the first practice of camp as I was, they just started stretching and I was walking down uh, the, the hill at Westchester in Philadelphia after signing my deal. It was, it was so embarrassing, but you know, what the hell are you going to do? So Marshall, you know, as, as camps are opening, you know, in, in the way of talking a little bit of, of all teams here in football, is there a team or two that maybe we're not talking about yet that you think could make a run this year? Um, you know, I, I like, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm thinking about divisions too and divisions that were maybe on the come up or had some, took some bruises in the past few years that might be a little stronger looking forward. Um, and the NFC South is intriguing. I like Atlanta a lot. I'm a big Arthur Smith fan. Um, listen, last year, you know, they, they were, t they had the, that balance of Mariota and Desmond Ritter who's your future, um, but you've got another year under his system, under his regime. Players love him. Um, that scheme on offense is great for, for linemen. It's great for, for explosive plays. You've got Drake London. You've got Kyle Pitts. Um, you've got, um, you know, guys coming back from suspension. I like the Atlanta Falcons kind of in a very sneaky way. They are they played a lot of close games last year. People forget, you know, Marcus Murray was not his best. He's now in Philadelphia. Um, I like Atlanta a lot. Um, I think another team is I'm I'm you know he'll he'll downplay it because he's that guy, but I still like Detroit. They're getting hyped, and Dan Dan Campbell doesn't want to hear any of it. But you know you have them on your schedule, and you know that like even with Jared Goff as a quarterback, you you put these weird limitations on what they can do, and here they are. They're gonna just bust you in the face, and it's just not the same Detroit Lions we're used to seeing, where it's like well they'll They'll go eight and eight. They'll flounder. They might go, you know, they might win a couple that are not supposed to win. Um, but they're, to me, they're an intimidating a team, especially in the new NFC North without Aaron Rodgers. There's a big vacuum there. You know, it's for the taking. It's it's for a new team to kind of stamp their flag at the top of that mountain uh, and be the perennial contender in the NFC North. So those two teams, uh, there's probably one that I'm forgetting. Um, but under the radar, kind of untalked about teams, those are the two that I like. Yeah, the Detroit Lions as true contenders is the world I've wanted to live in since Hard Knocks last year. And I know they got the great news the other day, too, that that C.J. Gardner-Johnson non-contact injury yeah. ended up with no structural damage also. So mm. a guy that certainly is vital to their secondary's health and performance. Uh, getting some good news. We'll see. Hopefully he's back on the field soon. Marshall, we appreciate the time, brother. Hopefully we'll get you back on here soon as we go towards uh, the season here and we promise less conditioning talk. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> what conditioning did you have to do? Uh, I mean, most play the Steelers, I don't even remember them actually like doing the true conditioning test. But when I was in New Orleans, um, I did one training camp with them. I got cut in an elevator in the other offseason. Sean Payton was really into CrossFit at that point. And so it was basically a CrossFit exercise. It was a series of sled pushes, med ball slams, and sit-ups that you had to cycle in one after the other and make in a certain amount of time by each position. Yeah, your face was my face, and uh, your boy did not have a great time with that conditioning test because, again, New Orleans food, uh, bad back, all those things creeped into play. <laughs> I was not pretty. It was not pretty. That is awful. You, oh, that sounds like an awful test. Oh, man. Yeah, you can go back and look at my headshot from that year, too. Um, your boy had gotten into a few of the beignets here. I am not proud of the way that my face looked in that picture. That is uh, the before shot that I will use in any weight loss success story from here on out as the after <laughs> picture hopefully gets clearer. All right, guys, before we finish off the show the way we always do, this, that, and the third, three quick stories to end your day. Want to make sure you know about our friends over at Knock Around Sunglasses. The summer is in full swing. If you could see, I am sweating a lot because it is hot out again because that means the sun's out again, and that means you need high-quality polarized shades that aren't going to break the bank. That is Knock Around Sunglasses. They also released the first nine teams of their MLB collection. You got the Red Sox. Yankees, the Cubs, the Cardinals, whole wide variety, lots of great colors. 
and the official U.S. women's soccer team sunglasses so you can add a little spice to that game day fit. We got another match coming up Wednesday. You want to be prepared and look your best while you watch the ladies play their best. So don't be the person squinting up at the sun, getting sand in their overpriced sunglasses. Check out knockaround.com. Get great-looking polarized shades starting at just $28. Um, Dad, let's get on to this, that, and the third. And this just oh. broke. Very scary yeah. news um, uh, coming out of the world of basketball. I saw courtesy of Shams over uh, at Stadium. Uh, you had LeBron James Jr. Uh, collapsed on the court Monday and had a cardiac arrest. He was taken to the hospital and is now in stable condition, no longer in the ICU. The statement from the univ- or the statement was read as follows: Yesterday, while practicing. Bronny James suffered a cardiac arrest. Medical staff was able to treat Bronny and take him to the hospital. He is now in stable condition and no longer in ICU. We ask to respect privacy of the James family, and we will update the media when there is more information. LeBron and Savannah wish to publicly send their deepest thanks and appreciation to the USC medical and athletic staff for their incredible work and dedication to the safety of their athletes. And so, Dad, much as we learned this past season, unfortunately, with everything that happened with DeMar Hamlin, the value of the medical staff, the people that are on yeah. site that are really in charge of the most important aspects of athlete health and safety. Once again, thankfully, there to be involved in this situation. But man, a, a scary, scary way to start LeBron James Jr.'s tenure here as a collegiate athlete. L- listen, I mean, when you think of heart conditions, cardiac conditions, you th- let's be honest, you think of older people. But in the last few years, with younger athletes, you know, after COVID and things like that, we've seen more have issues. And again, I have no idea what it's related with, but my point is you're seeing younger athletes having issues now. And and obviously we're so happy that he's out of the ICU and in stable condition, but then it's going to be, okay, what caused it? What did they find? Is it something that was a one-time thing that you don't think can happen again? Is there something related to it? For a teenager, I mean, dude's got a lot of life left. And to have this, I mean, that it's unbelievably scary, obviously, for the kid. But me being a parent, as a parent, seeing this happen to your child, oh, my God, I just, I can't even fathom that. And uh, you just, you hope everything's okay. They find out, found out what caused it. And if it's something that can be worked on and fixed, hopefully uh, it can be. But uh, that is, uh, what, a, what, a, what a scary, scary thing. Yeah, over the years, we've seen a lot of examples of athletes through sports, through having to go through physicals, getting yep. ready for the draft yes. in some cases, find you know problems that were there that maybe you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Competitive athletics is such a stress test to the body. And so we hope everything is okay with Bronny. I mean, God, as a young athlete, that feeling of invincibility that you walk around oh, with so much yeah. can sometimes get you through injuries that we're used to, knees, shoulders, things like that. But when it's your heart, when it's your brain when it's things that are so vital like that it's such a scary reminder of how fragile this can all be so certainly well wishes to Bronny. we hope he has a speedy recovery and feels a lot better here soon uh dad no easy transition but let's get to that um back into the world of i'd say normal sports but this story feels anything <laughs> but normal as we saw the news yesterday that the saudi team al halal made a record Offer to Kylian Mbappe, the PSG, and now it feels like former PSG star who has yeah, been yeah. removed from all of their, you know, training trips right now and everything as he gets ready to try and make his way to Real Madrid. But Al Halal uh, received permission to negotiate directly with him and offer what would be a record one point one billion dollar offer. Now about three hundred million dollars of that would be the transfer fee to Paris Saint Germain and seven hundred and seventy six million dollars would be offered to Mbappe, who, according to sources telling ESPN, is apparently not interested in the offer, Dad, because I guess when you're 24 and worth a couple of hundred million and stand to make a couple hundred more, the idea of taking blood money may not appeal to you all that much. Yeah, and listen, this is where we are, because you wonder, I mean, do, do you? we always wonder when we see, see big deals, how do they make that up? And I don't know if they make this up, because look at Liv. I mean, Liv, the Saudis paid those golfers a ton of money, And they're barely watched. They're barely a blip on anybody's radar. Now we'll see the merger with the PGA and what happens. But 
you wonder they're just handing out money to get athletes to come over there. And we know the whole sports washing term that has been used and such. Uh, and, and remember, Cristiano Ronaldo is already there. And by the way, from all reports, wants out of there. And now they want to bring Mbappe in, and he wants no part of it. As you mentioned, he's 24, and his net worth is already around $200 million. And, oh, by the way, it's not like he's playing for free anywhere. It looks like he's expected to join Real Madrid, and if he does, he's going to get about $100 million to sign there. So it's not like he's not making any money. But, my God, to think that for a year of playing a sport, your salary could be $776 million in a vacuum – Blows my mind. Absolutely blows my mind. And then even more when the person says, eh, Nat, don't think I'm going to do it. Yeah, and uh, to your point about the sports washing, they're getting exactly what they wanted. You're right. This is not about recouping a return on investment. It's about washing a reputation and getting people right. to talk nice about you in public. And when you've got LeBron James, when you've got Giannis Antetokounmpo tweeting jokingly, ha-ha, laugh, laugh, about how they'll be ready when they call right there is sort of an ominous sign of things to come when you've got athletes just seeing the dollar amounts and not any of the other bad stuff. That's the goal. And so I think that was a big win in its own way for the Saudi royal family and the PIF yesterday, seeing the response to that going online. Dad, let's get to the third. Speaking of the response, this was a wild one. After we saw Florida A&M briefly suspend their football activities, their head coach, Willie Simmons, after a video shot by Tallahassee rapper Boston, a real Boston Richie, got posted on social media showing the Florida A&M locker room, players, actual branded team-issued gear, all apparently without the school's permission here now. Their athletic director, Tiffany Dawn Sykes, said Monday they'll be allowed to resume using the team facilities while the university continues to investigate this. Dad, didn't have this on my preseason bingo card for things that we'd be presented, but uh, one, the song wasn't really all that good. Now, I know uh, this rapper is apparently really well-known, really well-liked down in Tallahassee, right, maybe right. just not my cup of tea, but uh, I'm not sure. How do you get all this equipment inside of the locker room with nobody noticing? Like, what time do you got to shoot this on campus for this to not raise any eyebrows? I mean, listen, there's cameras everywhere nowadays. So to not see that there was any any cameras or any footage of them going into the facility. I mean, usually nowadays you need the, the cards to get into the facility so they know who's going in. I mean, I, I, this blows my mind that this got out. And let me tell you what, the players, while football activities were suspended, should probably have been happy because we know what happens when they go back and their coach is the one who had suspended them. It's kind of Woo! the same thing when you got – it's kind of the same thing when you got nailed for uh, underage drinking at Notre Dame and had to deal with Charlie Weiss at 5 o'clock or the strength coach every morning. You know what these guys are going to be doing? They're going to be throwing up. They're going to be running steps. They're going to be doing stuff, and they're going to be throwing up a lot. <laughs> They are, they are going to be listening. The song was called Send a Blitz. They are going to have Send the Blitz on repeat <laughs> while that coach <laughs> runs them into the ground. He is going to make the association with that song nothing but pain for these young people on this team. There are There is probably no surer bets in sports right now than if you drove by wherever their practice field is, that song blaring and the sound of people <laughs> throwing up in the background. You are absolutely right. Hopefully you're not throwing up listening to this podcast. If you made it through clean, download, subscribe, rate, review, leave us that five-star rating, and check us out on YouTube. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Go, go. Boom. Money in the bank.